Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Kentucky Derby edition of the Timeform U.S. Forecast. I am David Aragona here with my usual co-host, Craig Milkowski, to do a deep dive into Kentucky Derby 150, talking about all of the contenders, really taking a deeper look at the Timeform U.S. pace projector. Craig and I did put out a video about the Kentucky Derby on DRF's YouTube channel earlier this week. I think it was verging on 30 minutes, but we kind of rushed through some of the contenders, so we want to really take our time going through each horse in the Kentucky Derby field on on this podcast, have a little bit more of a free form, loose discussion about these horses, skipping a little over the place a little bit, and using some of the time form USPPs uh, to talk about our uh, all of the contenders in this race. Towards the end, I think we'll also try to get to some Kentucky Oaks opinions. So uh, we wrap that into the podcast too. But that is our plan of attack for this time form US forecast this week, Craig. And looking forward to discussing this Kentucky Derby with you. Yeah, I sure am. I mean, it's finally here. It seems like we wait for this for months on end, and we kind of start talking about it after the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, and uh, it's it's finally here. And as much as I love horse racing year-round, I am one of those guys that, that loves the Kentucky Derby. It's kind of the ultimate challenge. Now, we were originally planning to record this on Tuesday morning. It is currently Tuesday afternoon of recording this, and it's kind of a good thing we had a bit of a scheduling hiccup because uh, we the news of Encino's uh, departure from this Kentucky Derby field uh, was announced uh, on uh, Tuesday afternoon, very early afternoon. So he will not be playing. It's going to be a field of 20 now with Epic Ride drawing in as far as uh, the news stands at the moment. We'll see if things change in the coming days. But now there is just one horse on the also eligible list, that is Mugatu. So that changes things a little bit, Craig. And as we start to talk about um, the impact of maybe that switch of horses, like Epic Ride for Encino, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we'll show the time form US past performances. And I think we should start by having a discussion of this pace projector uh, because we talked about it a little bit on the preview that we did the other day. Uh, but I think we can talk a little bit more about where some of this data comes from for those that might not be that familiar with Timeform US. I know a lot of our listeners are familiar with what we're talking about, but I know we get some new listeners around this time of year, but the Kentucky Derby attracting a lot more eyes than maybe a typical horse racing event. So Craig, just talk a little bit about how we arrive at these projections that are shown on the Timeform US pace projector and you know, how running styles impact and the pace figure work that you do. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting story how this came about. I mean, I don't want to get into the, all the details, but I'll just discuss what it is. And what the pace projector does is try to tell you, based on the horse's past races, where we think they're going to be placed at the uh, half-mile call and route races, which obviously the Kentucky Derby is. And we base that on two things. Uh, it's how fast these horses have run early, and that is derived from the pace figures, and uh, more so, I should say, from the adjusted times at Timeform US, which kind of equates uh, how fast horses have run at different distances and on different surfaces, because a, a hundred pace figure at six furlongs isn't the same raw speed as a hundred pace figure at a mile and a quarter. It's obviously you have to run much faster to get that pace figure at six furlongs. So we kind of equate everything, but then we also look at the running style of the horses and what they've displayed because there, there's times if the pace is fast enough where a horse who's actually a closer could get a, a pretty fast pace figure. And we want to look at both those things. Thing. So it's a combination of the two, um, a little more slanted toward how to how fast the horses have run to, uh, instead of the running style. But we try to predict where the horses are going to be. Uh, we don't really put any opinion into it. We don't look at riders or trainers. About the only other real adjustment we make is if there's an equipment change. And when I say equipment, specifically blinkers. If horses are removing or adding blinkers and it's different from races past, then we will either upgrade or downgrade the horse a little bit early speed-wise. And that's just because of the studies we have done shown that's what happens, that when horses take uh, add blinkers, they're a little closer to the pace. And when they take them off, they're usually a little bit more off of the pace. So it's just a reflection of basically how fast the horses have run and what kind of running style they've displayed in past races. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, when I posted this uh, pace projector in social media the other day, I know there was some confusion about the number eight, just a touch shown leading when he has not technically led in any of his prior races at the first call. Uh, he did uh, lead at the half mile call in his debut race going six furlongs. I will note, uh, but Craig, 
the pace projector is just basically saying, as you were as you were covering very well, um, the pace projector is just basically saying to you that this horse has the greatest potential early speed, and you've shown it on a consistent enough basis to have his pace rating be higher than everybody else's. It doesn't mean that you know Brad Cox has indicated that he is necessarily going to want uh, Florent Drew to send just the touch to the lead. It's just saying that this horse has the early speed. It can't really figure in connection or rider intention. That's going to be part of the handicapping process. But the pace projector should inform your handicapping process so you at least know which horses are capable of getting forward. And I think it starts to get the wheels turning in your brain about where certain horses are placed and what they're going to have to do to get to the front end in a race. Like with the number 17 fierceness, I know some people might be a little bit confused that he's shown back in a shared fifth place on this pace projector now after the scratch of Encino with Epic Ride drawing in. Even Epic Ride has shown being a little bit faster than fierceness in the early stages and Fierceness has obviously done his best running when he's on the front end. And I think with Fierceness, it just makes you think about, well, is he going to have to run a little bit faster than maybe what has been in his comfort zone? Because the pace projector showing him where he's placed is projecting what has been his comfort zone from a pace standpoint in his prior races. So the pace projector, it's not always going to be 100% accurate, but it does give you a good some good insight into how fast these horses typically run and what they're going to need to do on race day to get the kind of trips that they really need. Yeah, that's that's a great way to freeze it with a horse like Fierceness. We'll obviously dig into him a lot more as we go into the individual horses, but we'll see. He's never had any red fractions in any of his races, indicating he was in a fast pace race, whereas a horse like Just the Touch was chasing a blazing fast pace. And the other thing I wanted to note about the pace projector is the more horses run, the better it's going to be able to understand how a horse is and how he likes to run just to touch has only run three times in his career only one time around two turns so maybe he won't be a front runner but in my opinion he certainly has the capability to be if chad brown's other horse top connor hadn't been in the bluegrass hard to say he wouldn't have been in the front leading that race and that horse was essentially a rabbit that day for sierra leone so um I don't necessarily disagree with the pace projector. Maybe just a touch won't go, but I, I think he's going to be right there just because he's naturally a really fast horse. Yeah, Craig, I'll be honest. I'm not exactly sure who's going to be leading under the wire the first time or even at the half mile, this pace projector, as is indicated on the screen. It's a projection for four furlongs into the race when you're going a mile and a quarter. So basically heading on to the backstretch. We'll see who's ultimately in front. I would not be surprised if it was any one of five or six horses. Um, obviously, the three that are shown towards the front end, if Doorknock breaks alertly from the rail, which is no guarantee, it can be really tough to get to the front end from a rail post position in a 20-horse field. Uh, but uh, he's one that I know the connections have expressed. They want him to be forward. We've already covered just the touch. He's got that natural speed. He might just fall into a forward position potentially on the lead. Track Phantom is a horse that is really good jumping away from the starting gate. And we've talked about that on the forecast and the pace cast before. He's just a really good gate horse. So he might just naturally break maybe a half step ahead of some other horses. And that could put him very forward, maybe even in front. Steve Asperson is adding the blinkers. Asperson did give a quote saying something to the effect of, he'd be surprised if track phantom is on the lead, but I never want to put too much stock into what trainers say. If this horse breaks well, I don't think Joel Rosario is going to be taking anything away from him. And, you know, we should probably now take the opportunity to talk about the number 21 Epic ride. I mean, he's shown just off the leaders on the pace projector. Um, he's got plenty of early speed. He's got the fourth highest uh, early pace rating of any of these in the field. And they kind of have changed his running style a little bit through recent starts to train him to rate off horses a little bit, but he had sprint speed through the first three starts of his career, uh, leading Gate to Wire going six furlongs in his second race, setting some solid fractions. So if they want to use that outside post and use his speed to get over, they could potentially have intentions to get forward with him. And I guess that makes things a little difficult for fierceness because... Todd Pletcher probably does not want this horse to be on an all-out send to get to the front on all at all costs. Uh, even when you're riding the best horse, you don't want to do anything too silly and lose the race in the first quarter mile. So they want to get him into a comfortable rhythm. I'm just not quite sure where that comfortable rhythm is going to place fierceness. They definitely want to keep his face clean and have him out in the clear. So we'll see how that all plays out. And then the biggest wild card of all, Craig, is that Japanese horse, the number 10, Tio Password. He is not shown on the pace projector because we don't make 
pace figures for almost all non-North American races. Uh, just a couple of years, we've done it for the Dubai races when uh, it seemed like those horses would be uh, significant pace players in the Kentucky Derby, but we didn't do it this year for some good reason. And, and T.O. Password, both races in Japan, we don't have any basis to make pace figures for those Japanese races. So he's been a front runner over there, just not really sure how much speed he really possesses and how it's going to compare to some of these American horses. Yeah, he was impossible to place on the pace projector this year. Sure, we know he had speed in Japan. And yeah, there's data available. You could make speed fi- or speed and pace figures for Japan if you had the time. The problem is we don't know how those pace figures would compare to the figures here in the United States because we just don't get very many shippers here from Japan and we get no shippers from the U.S. to Japan or just very, very rarely one will show up for one of the big races. So it's just a task that it's not really possible uh, given the the way the horses ship these days. And frankly, um, the other Japanese horse that won in Dubai, uh, he's not a front runner, so he wasn't really going to affect the pace projector much. If I had to guess where he was going to be, I'd probably put him towards maybe the rear third of the field. I think there will be four or five, maybe six horses behind him, but I certainly don't certainly don't think he's going to be a pace factor. I will say T.O. Password's workout this morning maybe might lead some people to believe that he's going to be more forward than maybe we're giving him credit for. Because even though it seems like he's coming out of some slow paced races in Japan, just because horses are leading through slow paced races doesn't mean they can't run faster. I think we've seen that at Kentucky Derby's past. And this horse, I mean, reeled off a four furlong drill this morning at 46 and change, which is a little bit out of character for the Japanese training style. I think we've seen how these Japanese horses train over here, and they typically do more variations in speed than just rattling off a quick blowout like that. So I wonder if this horse is going to be a little more forward. He actually trained in company with um, a Japanese horse that's older that will be running in the Ali Shiva Stakes on Friday. And having watched some of that horse's races, he's really fast out of the starting gate and typically leads in his races. And um, he was having some trouble keeping up with T.O. Password. So maybe this horse is pretty fast, Craig, and that could just add even more pace to the race if it turns out he is capable of running a 45 or 46 half mile. Yeah, the one thing I would say, and I I think we both agree, is in the upper right-hand corner of that pace projector, it indicates the pace is going to be fast. And I think we both agree with that, that we would be very surprised if it's not a fast pace. Now, every Kentucky Derby I can remember has had at least one red fraction, so that's not exactly earth-shattering news. I mean, it's 20 horses trying to get inside, save ground, and you have to use speed to do that. But I think this year there is more speed than what we've seen in some of the more recent editions. Well, let me now make this pace projector a little smaller and I'll drag it over to the corner of the screen as we start to go through some of these contenders. And let's move on to uh, the first horse in the field drawn down towards the inside, the number one door knock. And we'll begin our conversation with him, Craig. And it's a good transition because he's a horse that could be critical to how this pace develops if he is indeed sent from his rail post position. This horse does have plenty of early speed. Maybe we haven't necessarily seen how fast he can go in his two starts so far this year, just because because he didn't have to in the Fountain of Youth and in the Bluegrass, they experimented with raiding him a little bit, but he showed that he could set a pretty fast pace and keep going in the Remsen when he uh, finished up his two-year-old campaign last year. He was breaking from an inside post that day and really had to be ridden hard to secure that position heading right into the clubhouse turn, and he continued battling on every step of the way, actually defeating Sierra Leone, the only time that horse is lost. So Dornock does have real early speed, I just wonder if it's been dulled a little bit by some of his three-year-old performances. And I also just wonder from the overall sense, if he's a horse that's really taken that step forward from two-year-old to three-year-old season. It doesn't look like much of a step forward from his two-year-old season when you look at his time form U.S. speed figures. I mean, he ran a 107, I think it was, or a 112 in the Remsen, something like that. And he just hasn't taken a step forward. And more importantly to me, he he just hasn't really looked like the same horse um, that – race at Gulfstream, it was just decimated by late scratches. There wasn't much left and he kind of had a cakewalk. And then last time, yeah, maybe they tried raiding him, but that was a really fast pace. And he actually had very good position and he just really didn't have anything left. Now, maybe the track was playing a little bit speed favoring that day, but 
he just seems like a horse who hasn't moved forward. Only that two point improvement from his two year old season. Uh, some questions about, you know, just what kind of trip is he going to be able to work out from the rail? If he is able to break and make the front, uh, he's going to face a lot of pressure. And if he's not, there's really nothing in his PPs that would indicate to me that he's going to like it very much. Yeah, I, I'm concerned about some of those same things with Doorknock, especially watching some of his morning training this year. I mean, he is a horse that created a lot of buzz about how well he was training as a two-year-old. And from my eye, he just hasn't really gone on the way that I want to see. Even before a race like the Bluegrass, I saw him get slightly outworked by a horse that I thought he should have handled more easily in the morning. And he's just... Um, He's just not for me in this race. I have concerns about the trip. I have concerns about his overall ability at this point in time. So I'm finding it a little tough to make a case for him. And he is one of these horses that has a bit of a reputation. So I think there's a ceiling for how high his price can go. I don't think you're going to get 30, 35 to 1 on door knock. And that's sort of the range that I would need to even get interested in, uh, in him in this race. He did. He is the younger half brother or full brother, I should say, to last year's Kentucky Derby winner. So I could imagine that alone just attracting some support door knocks way. Number two, Sierra Leone, who's drawn right alongside him in the starting gate, Craig. You know, when I posted that pace projector on Twitter the other day, uh, some people were expressing surprise that Sierra Leone was shown towards the back of the pack. Actually, off the screen of the pace projector is one of the final two horses that's projected to be trailing the field early. I guess my question is to them is, who would you expect Sierra Leone to be in front of early in this race? Because there aren't too many deep, deep closers like him in this field. And it just seems like a lot of these horses want to either be forward or somewhere in mid pack. And somebody has got to be 18th, 19th or 20th early. And kind of feels like he's got to be that far back. We'll see if it works against him because he does have that big late kick. Yeah, his late kick is undeniable. I mean, he's going to be finishing this race fast. The The question is, when is he going to be able to start his run? And will it be too late? Because I, I think it's a given he'll be coming. But I'm with you. I, I just don't see where it's an issue that he's shown so far back. Because who are the horses he's going to be in front of? He's a horse, even when he had a blinkers, he just doesn't show a lot of speed. The pace is going to be really fast. So I don't even know if... Uh, keeping him closer would be a smart idea. I think what you want to do is just let him drop back, save ground, and hope to work out a good trip. And maybe he very well will. I just don't know if that's something you want to take a short price on. I mean, I, I think Sierra Leone is going to run very well in here, but there's definitely think some things going against him because of his running style. Yeah, I mean, you could even see at the start of the bluegrass, I mean, most of the horses left for position and he was almost immediately three to four lengths behind all the other horses that were not Magatu. I mean, uh, he's just not a horse that possesses that kind of early gate speed. So he's probably going to drop back towards the back of the pack. For me, I don't think that was any surprise. Um, as for his overall ability, Craig, I'm not totally sure how to regard him because he's obviously one of the two favorites coming into this race will probably be a clear-cut second choice behind Fierceness. From a speed figure standpoint, he hasn't run that much faster than a lot of horses that are going to be bigger prices than him. What he does have is that reliability. He's going to show up. He just delivers that big late run from about the half-mile pole home. We're watching the replay of the Bluegrass here, and he actually gets passed by Magatu on the backstretch. He's briefly in last place, and Tyler Gaffleone does a good job saving ground, actually giving him a good bit of schooling as he weaves out and in between horses uh, to get Sierra Leone ultimately to the outside to unleash that big stretch kick. And I do think this horse is going to be charging at the end and a mile and a quarter doesn't seem like it's going to be much of a problem for him at all. It's just for me, a matter of what is the right price on Sierra Leone, a deep closer like this who has so much traffic to overcome. I'd peg my fair price somewhere around five to one. And I'm just not sure I'm going to get that on Sierra Leone, especially uh, with, with a scratch of Encino who could have been like the seventh or eighth choice, choice in this race uh, coming out. Yeah, I kind of view him the same way. I, I think he's going to run well, but I don't think he's going to offer much value. I kind of look at his last race as, I mean, that pace was just blazing fast, and he really did get a perfect trip to win. Now, you can argue he's probably going to get a similar pace for the Kentucky Derby, but it's going to be much tougher to work out that same trip. And as you note, he hasn't run all that much faster than a lot of the other horses in here. Now, granted, he's been getting better every time out. I won't be surprised 
surprised if he takes another forward move in, into the 120s, uh, which is probably what it's going to take to win a race like the Kentucky Derby. But for me, it's just a matter of price. If I was playing horizontals, um, I would absolutely have him on my ticket because I do think he can win this race. Uh, don't think I will be playing horizontals given how difficult all the races are, but uh, I think he'll run well. I just think he's going to be an underlay. And at the end of the day, uh, this is a race where you can make a lot of money if you're right, and you're not going to do it by playing the favorites. Uh, and I'm not just tossing him because he's the favorite. I, I just think there's some real question marks, and we haven't really touched on it, but I don't love the inside draw either because it is just – so easy to get shuffled back even further than maybe he wants to. Then you have to either work out a trip or you have to go wide on the turn. And, and when that happens, the horses up front are usually pulling away from you. So uh, I just think there's some real concerns with, with what he's going to be able to do and what his position is going to be with a quarter mile left to go, which is really probably going to determine how well he runs. Yeah, that's actually an interesting point, Craig, because right to the outside of him are horses like Mystic Dan, Catching Freedom, even Honor Marie, a couple of posts uh, wider than that. Those are all horses that also drop back, and their jockeys are probably going to want to get right on over to the rail, especially Brian Hernandez Jr. on Mystic Dan, who we're going to talk about next. And you could see Sierra Leone maybe not having the same gate speed as even a few of those horses. And if he gets shuffled back behind all three of them, then he is going to be 18th, 19th, 20th in the early stages. And we'll see if he just has too much ground to make up. But th that's kind of also a concern that I have about Sierra Leone and what the true true, true uh, right price on him is. Uh, so that's why I'm pegging it maybe a little bit higher than uh, some other people would. Uh, I know he's the a horse that many people are interested in making their pick in this year's Kentucky Derby. The number three, Mystic Dan Craig, well, I just kind of mentioned the trip that Brian Hernandez Jr. would be wanting to pull with him. He's a horse that loves to run along the rail. We saw that in the Southwest two back when he was just on that inside path every step of the way, kind of doing uh, his best Calvin Burrell impression as he sliced through inside at the top of the stretch to win going away at the end of this race. Mystic Dan, a little disappointing when he came back in the Arkansas Derby next time out, Craig. And I think it makes some people wonder whether this horse just really loved the muddy sealed track that he encountered in the Southwest or whether, like I think, uh, there was a real rail bias on Southwest Day that enhanced his performance a little bit. You could also say his Arkansas Derby, maybe he was a little bit against the flow that day. But personally, I wanted to see a little bit more from him if I was going to consider him a legitimate Kentucky Derby win candidate. Yeah, I think you kind of have to make a decision about that Southwest. And I'm on your side of things. I I, I don't think it was necessarily the muddy track. I, it seemed to play pretty fair that day. Um, I mean, horses handled it, I should, should say. Uh, like it was almost like a fast track. But I do think the rail was the place to be. And as you know, Brian Hernandez rode it perfectly. Um, he ran a fast race that day, a 117, which I think at the time was one of the faster races we had seen. Um, but I think the margins a little bit enhanced because of how he ran. I guess the alternate view would be that he was pretty much in the Kentucky Derby before the Arkansas Derby. Maybe he wasn't fully cranked up for that race and he ran okay. It's not like he ran terrible, but I don't know where the truth lies. I think it's probably somewhere in the middle. I think this horse is going to wind up getting a decent trip. He definitely has more tactical speed than some of the other closers we talked about, particularly Sierra Leone catching freedom. So I could see him working out a good trip and, and being there with a shot, but I tend to think he's probably not as good as what we, we saw in the Southwest. I agree with all of that, and I also wonder if he's a horse that really wants the mile and a quarter distance. I've always had some concerns about that with Mystic Dan. Moving on to the number four, Catching Freedom, Craig. You know, along with Sierra Leone, if you had to say to me, who, who's the most likely horse to just hit the board in the derby? For me, it would kind of be a toss-up between Sierra Leone and Catching Freedom, because I think this horse is pretty reliable. 
And you have to like his upward trajectory from a form and speed figure standpoint. I mean, he's just been taking moves forward with almost every start of his career. Um, and he's done things wrong along the way that he has since corrected. I mean, we talked about at the beginning of his career, he was really bad with his lead changes. And that kind of persisted for several starts. He was a horse who had a tendency to lug in a little bit. We saw that in the second start of his career when he lost at a very short price, out of sort of his own worst enemy that day. But what I liked most about his Louisiana Derby last time was that he seemed to get over all of that. He changed leads on cue. He stayed straight and focused through the stretch, and he unleashed the best turn of foot that I had seen him deliver really in any of his races so far. He just seemed like he was more dialed in and focused, not just in the stretch, but every step of the way, because unlike Sierra Leone, when you watch the starts of the races for Catching Freedom, he's not one of these horses that immediately has to drop back. He immediately grabs the bit and is in the bridle for his jockeys, and it's sort of up to Flavian Pratt to sort of hold him back early in the race and place him where he wants to be strategically. So Catching Freedom, he's not a horse that necessarily needs to be 18th or 19th early. I wouldn't be surprised if he has a little bit more mid-pack position in this derby, depending on how fast the early pace is. Um, and he's got that good late kick. Doesn't seem like distance is supposed to be a question for him. So there are a lot of favorable attributes that I think are working in catching freedom's favor. Yeah, I think if I remember right in the Risen Star Stakes, uh, not the Risen Star, in the Louisiana Derby, both you and I liked Honor Marie, but we also kind of were a little leery of uh, catching freedom in that race based on his race in the Risen Star and that was actually a, a race where I thought if he had behaved, he he very easily could have won that race and beat Sierra Leone if he would have just run straight. But it, it just seemed like it, he was relying or falling back on his old habits, wouldn't change leads, couldn't stay straight. The jockey was fighting him more than riding him. And he turned it all around in that Louisiana Derby. He looked like a, a much more professional racehorse. Uh, I believe you said in our preview that he's continued that in his workouts of late, that he's looked really good. So I'm not going to hold that loss to Sierra Leone against him because I, I thought there was a very good chance he was just as good had he been more professional. And he showed it in the Louisiana Derby. That was a powerful run through the stretch. And I don't think there's uh, many people that would argue with us if we said the Louisiana circuit was kind of the toughest path to the Derby. Uh, there's a lot of horses from there in this Kentucky Derby, and it just seemed like the strongest competition throughout. And he certainly wasn't disgraced and won the biggest race of them all. So I actually like him quite a bit in here, um, especially like you note. I don't see him dropping out to the back. Like, even though he did that in the Louisiana Derby, I don't think he had to do that. It was just how Flavian Pratt decided to ride him that day, and it worked out. But I could see him being much more forward than a horse like Sierra Leone or Honor Marie, who he defeated that day. So I'm expecting a big race from him as well. Yeah, the more I'm sort of seeing where people are landing in this derby and how opinions are developing since the race is drawn, I kind of feel like he's going to be the clear-cut third choice in the race. And he probably deserves to be for all the reasons that we're outlining. He just has uh, a really nice resume for a derby horse. And it, I was talking about this a little bit with uh, Gino Buchel. I did his uh, his podcast that he live streamed the, the other day, and we were discussing Catching Freedom in depth. And it one thing I like to look for in horses in the Kentucky Derby, Craig, are those horses that don't need to be ridden along. They travel in the bridle because the Derby is the kind of race where a hole's going to open up and you've got to seize that moment at uh, you know the very second that you have it. And it's going to close up a second later. And you don't want that horse that needs sort of five strides of riding to accelerate. You want that horse that's going to be there for you. As soon as you drop your hands as a rider, he's moving on through that hole. And Catching Freedom just seems like that kind of horse. He's a little more push button than some other closers that we're going to talk about in this race. So uh, I think those are all positive signs for him and why he probably does deserve to be um, single digits in terms of his odds in this year's Derby. The number five is Catalytic. And, you know, he, Catalytic brings up a discussion, Craig, that I think we should probably get right into of that Florida Derby speed figure, because everybody's got it a really fast race. I mean, Bayer had it even a little faster than you. I think Bayer got a 110. Um, it's a 126 time form U.S. speed figure, 127 final time number, which you can see in the chart here. Um, I always see it as a little bit of a red flag, Craig, when you see these big career best moves forward from horses in behind a blowout winner like Fierceness. And that's what we get from Catalytic and Gredmo the first, who 
I didn't visually didn't seem like they ran so well that I was expecting them to, you know, run 10 or 12 points better than they ever had in the Florida Derby, losing by the margin that they did, but they got those kinds of numbers. So it makes me question the speed figure just a little bit, not saying it's 15 points too high or anything like that. Maybe it's five points a little too high, but I think that's going to factor into our discussion of fierceness when we get there. And with catalytic Craig, I bring it up for him because when you look at his time form U.S. past performances, well, he ran a number last time that's almost just as fast as the number that Catching Freedom ran winning the Louisiana Derby. I still view Catching Freedom as a way more likely winner than this horse. I do as well. I've often talked about speed figures like this when you have a runaway winner. And the one thing that did make the speed figure at least um, – easier to make. I won't say easy is they did run the Gulfstream Park Oaks around two turns. Uh, I think they were probably the only two uh, on the day. Maybe there was one other. I don't remember off the top of my head, but even then they're not the same kind of race. They don't use the same finish line for those races. Uh, one's a quick run into the turn. So it's not always an apples to apples comparison, but it's fairly reliable. But I, I've seen many times over the years of making speed figures when you have a runaway winner like that, that the horses in between just seem to run faster than they normally would under I, uh, more normal circumstances. So I tend to discount these speed figures uh, for horses like that, for Catalytic, for Grandmo the first. Um, so, yeah, he's not going to be for me in here. I, I'm not sure what kind of trip he could even work out that would make him a contender. And even that 111 speed figure is, it's kind of right on the borderline of being a contender, which maybe sounds a little funny after catching freedom only had a 112 and I like him quite a bit, but I could see him taking a step forward where I don't really see that from catalytic. And I think the other point to make about the Florida Derby, Craig, is it was a pace a race run at a very even pace at every call. And those types of races, especially in dirt routes, are conducive to horses running their optimal speed figure. Whereas horses that go really fast early and slower late, kind of like we saw in the bluegrass, not always conducive to running a fast final time number. So I don't think Catalytic's going to get that same kind of pace set up in the Kentucky Derby where they run even splits every step of the way. We almost never see that in the run for the Roses. So just uh, maybe another reason to be a little skeptical of the horse that is very lightly raced and will only be making the second route attempt of his career in this Kentucky Derby. The number six, Just Steel Craig. Uh, He's coming in with one of the faster speed figures last time for an Arkansas Derby that came up very fast among these final round Derby preps. Obviously, the winner, Muth, not eligible for the Kentucky Derby, but Just Steel ran very well in defeat and something that, you know, I know I've brought up in the past that he was a horse that was pretty dirtied up coming into that Arkansas Derby. He had significant excuses in races like the Southwest and the Rebel, and it probably shouldn't have been a big surprise that he outran his odds at 32 to 1. Can he outrun his odds at the Kentucky Derby? We'll see about that. Yeah, I, I'm happy to admit I was wrong about this horse. I thought he was going to eventually turn out to be a one-turn horse. I know you were more optimistic, and it turned out he ran what's probably his best race at a mile and an eighth. Now, it wasn't good enough to beat Muth that day, who you know ran a really big race. I assume we'll see him in the Preakness and, and see uh, how he does, but Just Steel ran fine, obviously. He ran a very nice speed figure. Um in the spot, getting a 119 with the weight adjustment, which is how I look at my PPs. And um, he's got good tactical speed, which is something which usually serves horses well in the Derby. Uh, there always seems to be a horse, or at least one horse that you don't really expect to stick around that all of a sudden when they turn for home, he's right there uh, taking the lead. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's a horse like Just Steel. Now, whether he can finish off the race at a mile and a quarter, remains to be seen but he's going to be a big price and he certainly has the connections who know how to win a Kentucky Derby so I've written him off in the past um, I'm a little more uh, optimistic uh, given that run we saw in Arkansas yeah he's a horse that I don't totally trust so I'd need a big price on him probably somewhere just north of 20 to 1 um, given how likely I think he is to actually win the race and we'll see what price he is he is he does have a very popular trainer in his corner in uh, the legendary D. Wayne Lucas. Uh, 
but he is the kind of horse, Craig, and maybe we'll get to this when we discuss wagering later on in the podcast, that I would want to play around with in exotics in this race. Because like you were saying, I could see him being prominent until the quarter pole, and then we'll see what happens from there. Because he is the kind of horse that will cover ground and race forwardly, and he's got that stamina like we saw last time in the Arkansas Derby. So I'm definitely not writing him off. He's not in my top four picks in this race, uh, but he's one that I certainly considered and uh, could include in some exactas and trifectas. Number seven is Honor Marie. Kind of feels like he's turning into the buzz horse in this year's race, Craig, or maybe he's already turned into that horse. Uh, he was a very good two-year-old. I mean, his Kentucky Jockey Club, when you go back and watch it, that turn of foot that he unleashed from about the three-eighths pole to the furlong marker in mid-stretch was pretty devastating. He went from last to first in the blink of an eye and continued to draw off. In retrospect, I don't know how strong that Kentucky Jockey Club really was. The horses that finished behind him haven't done a whole lot since then. But what I do like from Honor Marie is that we've seen further progression from him in his three-year-old starts. Probably needed that race coming off the layoff in the Risen Star, and you could see the early pace figures for that Risen Star. I and mean, this is for just Honor Marie's running line. Um, going very slow early, a couple of blue color coded fractions, definitely working against this horse. But he was running on well at the end of that race. He was just really too far back to get there. And then he took that step forward that I think you would have expected second time off a layoff in the Louisiana Derby last time. Didn't close quite as effectively as Catching Freedom, but I still thought he ran well. It's not like he was letting Catching Freedom get away from him at the end. Catching Freedom sort of had more of that push-button turn of foot, but Anna Marie was staying on at the end of that race, and I think this horse has plenty of stamina, and watching his training for this race, Craig, I kind of understand why he's turning into the buzz horse. His workouts have impressed me too. He looks like he's really moving well over this Churchill surface, and he's training a lot better than I remember him early in the year where he just looked kind of so-so. I mean, getting out work sometimes, holding his own. Now he's out working horses that were, you know, actually working better than him early in the year. So uh, Omnery feels like a horse that's really coming into this Kentucky Derby in peak form. Yeah, I have more positives than negatives for Honor Marie. You covered a lot of them. I just, I think he's a horse who is going to love the mile and a quarter, not just get the mile and a quarter, but actually appreciate it. Uh, he's a horse who's getting better every time out. He's a horse who hasn't really had a lot of pace to run into in any of his races. Uh, you see one red fraction in his debut when he was able to get up to win at a distance, probably much shorter than he wanted. Um, the only real negative I have on him is, is just complete lack of early speed. I could see him dropping straight to the back of the field, uh, being in the same boat as Sierra Leone, maybe not as inside as that one is, but that's the only real negative I have. He's he's going to be three or four times the price of Sierra Leone. Uh, I don't think he's going to be what the morning line is, but I, I think he'll be double digits in here. So I think you're going to get a run for your money if you bet this horse at 10 or 12 to 1. And, you know, I think he's pretty likely, more likely than not, to be in the super effect at the end. I expect them to run well, just kind of like the uh, the second choice. Kind of uh, can he work out a trip and can he get that sustained run that he's going to need without having to uh, stop? Yeah, I don't rate him that much lower than Catching Freedom in terms of his likelihood to win the race or his ability. Um there is a difference in connections, Craig. I don't know how much that's going to influence the price. There's a difference in jockeys. And nothing against Ben Curtis, who was getting his first shot in the Kentucky Derby as an uh, Irish and, I think, English riding jockey. Uh, but Flavian Pratt, who's on Catching Freedom, I mean, we didn't talk about it, but Flavian Pratt has this amazing record in the Kentucky Derby, where I think he's ridden like six mounts and he's been in the money, I want to say, five times. I mean... <laughs> It's hard to finish in the money at the Kentucky Derby, and obviously Flavian Pratt's had some good mounts, but when you go back and watch some of the rides he's given in this race, I mean, with, with just a little more racing luck or slightly more horse underneath him, he could have won four or five derbies. So, I mean, he just seems to be really know how to how to manage this task of riding in this race, and I think that's definitely in catching freedom's favor, and uh, I do think you have to consider that connections uh, when handicapping a race like this. So maybe that's one reason why I would rate catching freedom just a notch above of Honor Marie, but uh, in terms of his likelihood to win the race, I do think Honor Marie is going to be a better price. As you said, not 20 to 1, probably around 12, 13, 14 to 1 is what I'm expecting. And for me, that, that's potentially the right, uh, the right value on him. Yeah, you make a good point about the jockeys. We don't often talk about it because 
99 times out of 100, the jockey is baked into the price. And if you get a better rider, you're going to have a lower price. But in a race like this, uh, similar to turf racing, I do think it's a little more important. And they probably should be bet a little more because the bigger the field, the more important the jockey is. And we just don't know about Ben Curtis. Uh He's ridden fine here in the States. I won't be shocked if he wins. We've seen uh, lower, lesser known connections, both trainers and riders win the Derby in the recent past. So nothing would really surprise me. But yeah, you have to give a slight edge to a guy like Pratt over, over Curtis. The number eight is just a touch, Craig. And I guess the question I want to ask you about this horse is, if this were not the Kentucky Derby and it were just some random race at Churchill on a Thursday, I feel like I know your handicapping style a little bit by this point. And this feels like your kind of horse because he's coming out of a fast paced race where he ran really well. He survived the pace better than anybody, got this big pace upgrade. He's been a speed figure star in almost every start of his career so far. Seems like he's got no shortage of stamina given the way he ran going nine furlongs last time. So why are we not liking this horse more? I think mostly for me, it's field size and just the composition of the field and what kind of trip is this horse going to get? He also kind of took a really big jump up last time from a speed figure perspective. I mean, the Gotham, yeah, it looked okay. It wasn't all that fast of a race. The Terministic didn't do a whole lot of running when he came back in the wood. I wonder about how strong that race was. And I've kind of grown to be leery of what I consider basically a one number horse in the Kentucky Derby. He only has that one big effort and these kind of horses have just burned me too many times in the past. Um, I often say, well, I won't be surprised if he wins, but he's not for me. But in this case, I probably will be surprised if he wins. And it's just, it's only his fourth career start. I, I don't think that's the end of the world. We saw Mage win in his fourth career start. Uh, and that seems to be the trend. Eventually, that's probably going to be the norm when horses are winning in their third or fourth career start the way the game is going. But at this point in time, it just seems like a little too much too soon to me. And I also wonder about the trip from the eight post because I think he's going to get some real pressure from the outside. Uh, he could very well get pressure from the inside side door knock so it's tough for me to see him working out a trip and being able to handle it this early in his career i want to be careful with just throwing this horse out of my wagers craig because i mean you know obviously we made a little bit of that mistake with mage last year where i think we both thought the same thing about him running a better race than forte in the florida derby and we dismissed him anyway even though we knew he was really talented and it was just a touch i have the same concerns that you have about him handling another taxing pace situation in just the fourth start of his career. But he's got the right trader in his corner. He's obviously got a ton of ability. And I mean, I don't have too many doubts about that bluegrass speed figure, Craig. I mean, it, it was a bit of a step up for Sierra Leone, um, but the pace upgrade makes sense. I know some people feel it's uh, Keeneland was generally a little speed favoring by that uh, point in the meet on April 6th. And maybe that helped just the touch just a little bit. Um, but I still thought he ran a really strong race that day. And I, I get the sense this horse has a lot of ability and I, I'm not going to be shocked when he is up to the task. And when a lot of people view him the way we're viewing him and he goes off at 14 to one, 16 to one and pays $30 in this race. Um, so he's a horse that I would consider for exotics. I don't trust him, but he's got a lot of ability. And as I went through this race, there weren't too many horses that I could sort of put on that level of feeling like they're actually talented enough to win the Kentucky Derby. And this one might be. So I'm not, I'm not totally eliminating him, even though he's, uh, he's not one of the horses that I'm most interested in. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, it all comes down to price, right? Uh, at the end of the day, we're handicapping. Handicapping is assessing a horse's chances versus his price. If he's 10 to 1, I'm not interested. If all of a sudden I look up and he's 18 to 1, yeah, I'd, I'd have a few bucks on him because I'd feel silly if I didn't bet him, given that I'm the one that, that makes the speed figures and I think has him as the second fastest horse in the race. So comes down the price. I, I still... And not all that optimistic because of the trip, but yeah, you know, I, I guess he's one that has shown the ability at least. 
Yeah, on, on the line that I did for this race, I have Honor Marie and Just the Touch at the same price, and I won't be surprised if Just the Touch even goes off a tick higher than that one. Uh, just kind of based on what I've seen, uh, you know, the conversation developing heading into this Kentucky Derby. Well, we'll skip over Encino, obviously, who will not be running. And uh, I think we've already covered T.O. Password, talking about the pace situation, Craig. Um, I don't view him as a contender in this race. Uh, you know, it's hard to say that with utmost certainty because we just don't know that much about him. But I wasn't that impressed with his stakes win last time that qualified him to get here. I looked up the records of some of the horses in behind him. They're okay, but they're probably not as good as some of the horses that Forever Young beat in Japan. And he was kind of life and death to hold on that rate in that race after getting a very good trip and what seemed like a comfortable pace up front. He's going to have to run a lot faster if they have intentions to make the front here. So it just seems like a really tall order for this horse. Yeah, he's not for me. I, I've watched his replays a few times. It, it's hard to really know what he was beating, but as you said, it, it's not. We know Forever Young is one of the most highly regarded horses and what he's done. We don't really know about T.O. Password. Um, I, I just, I don't know enough. He's not going to be a big enough price for me to take a stab. Uh, and I just didn't see anything to sway me in, into his corner. Let's move on to the other Japanese runner in this field, definitely the more highly regarded of the two, Forever Young, Craig. And um, this is sort of a polarizing horse in this year's Kentucky Derby because I've seen a lot of people just tossing him. And I know he's got some some real devotees who, who just are believers in his ability. He's five for five. So I mean, he gets the job done and he's got this international resume having competed in Japan as a two-year-old. They've taken this Middle East route to get to the Kentucky Derby, which the Japanese have tried in the past. And it has not worked out, but they have had success along the way winning some of those prep races. And he won both of them this year, the Saudi Derby and the UAE Derby, which are two very different kinds of races. One is a one-turn mile. The other is a two-turn mile and three sixteenths. That's much more of a test of stamina for a demanding course in Dubai. And he won both of those races, Craig, and I thought ran the best race each time. Um, the big question with Forever Young is... Well, I guess there are two big questions. Um, there's one big question for me, but I know there are two questions out there. One of them is his ability. And how does he really stack up to some of these top U.S.-based horses? Because we don't have speed figures for those races. There aren't too many common company lines. It's hard to really know. And I guess the other question a lot of people have is the trip and this narrative that's you know been put out there that he's a horse that can't handle kickback. And a horse that can't handle kickback can't possibly win the Kentucky Derby. So he's destined to get a bad trip. So I mean, those are sort of the two talking points around Forever Young. How, do, how are you viewing this horse? <laughs> well, I know you've kind of debunked the kickback win, and which is, seems odd because the trainer is the one saying the horse doesn't like kickback. But you showed the replay, I, I think, when I, or you pointed it out where he broke it. I think it was when he broke his maiden or one of his early stakes wins. And this horse was pinned inside all the way and took plenty of kickback. And he ran just fine. So it's hard to say. Maybe if he gets stuck inside, he'll be fine. I guess the big question would be, does the trainer give those instructions to the rider? And because of that, he's six wide all the way around the track, which isn't going to be the easiest trip. It worked for him in Dubai where he was wide all the way around. Um, that field, I don't think was particularly strong, but he did what he had to do. He ran well. If I attempted to make speed figures for this race. I think it came out to about a 112, if memory serves. But nothing I would want to go on the record because it was a really tough day to make speed figures for. I was more impressed with his race in Saudi when he was able to beat uh, Bookham Dano, a horse who we have seen race in the States and who is actually pretty fast. And it put up some good speed figures. And that horse looked like he was home free and for forever young just came and got him uh, against the way the flow of the race seemed. And I was more impressed with him that day. I, I think this horse is good. I think he fits ability wise. It's a tough field, but um, I'm not going to be surprised if this one gets the job done. It's going to happen eventually, probably sooner or later that one of these Japanese horses ship here and wins the Kentucky Derby because they're just really good horses. We've seen it internationally. I think it's just a matter of time. I didn't make forever young my selection in the race, but I I'm not going to be shocked. I think he's going to run well. 
Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll I'll cover a few points with him, Craig. The kickback thing. Yeah, you, you mentioned his debut race where he sort of got, I mean, it was a very good trip. He was sort of in behind the wall of horses every step of the way. He wasn't far back in the pack. He was sort of in, you know, the second flight stalking. And he came through between horses seamlessly like he had done it all before. And it was his career debut. Very professional. I think that the conversation that his connection started about maybe him not liking kickback, it stems from the second race at the track called Mombetsu. Um, and you can look up the replay on YouTube, but it's a little hard to, to find if you search for it. I think I posted it on my Twitter account, though. Um, he did really dislike the kickback in that race. He runs the entire race with his head basically up in the air, trying to like get air above all of the, the dirt that was coming back at him, or, or more like sand. I, when you watch that race, I don't know where they got that dirt track from. It looks like they imported sand from a beach. So, I mean, it, it seemed like a different kind of kickback than you would experience in the United States, for sure. Um, but this horse, I mean, he's kind of like the opposite of fierceness, because he had he got the kind of trip in that second race that you would expect a horse to like lose by 15 lengths while he was traveling. And once they got him to the outside, he still produced a kick and like unleashed this huge late run to win the race. So, I mean, he can be uncomfortable early and he still gets it done. I mean, you watch the Saudi Derby that you were talking about too back. He broke a step slowly that day. It seemed like he was a little uncomfortable at the pace of their race because, like you said, Book of Dano is a really fast horse. And even he wasn't on the lead in that race. They were really moving up front and Forever Young had to come under a ride a long way from home. And he still got there, going a distance that probably is a little too short for him. And last time in Dubai, it was a much softer trip, as you said. He was out in the clear every step of the way. He was wearing his hood <laughs> to, I guess, protect him from a kickback. I don't know what that actually does. Um, and, and I think the hood is what's getting people talking about the kickback so much because obviously the connections were aware of the second start. I mean, they, you know, they own and train the horse. And in Dubai, that's a place where you generally don't want the kickback. So I guess they made a move and now everyone keeps talking about it because they did that. I think, uh, you know, those, these things spiral, these conversations spiral out of control sometimes, uh, but forever young has been really professional in almost every other start. He does sometimes break a step slowly. So I don't think he's going to be that forward in this race because the truth of the UAE Derby was it was run at a pretty moderate pace every step of the way. And he probably is going to be more of a closing type and have to come under a ride from a little further out than, than he did last time. But, you know, Craig, watching back the UAE Derby and you know, kind of putting a stopwatch to, to the end of it a little bit, I mean, they came home the final quarter, or I should say final 400 meters, in just a tick over 24 seconds. They were really finishing that day. So, I mean, when you come home that fast, maybe you can't open up the kind of gap that you know, the horse's superior talent would expect you to see at the end of a race like that. And the, the horse who was contesting the pace every step of the way was second, and Forever Young did run by him. So this horse is a really strong finisher. I have no questions about distance. Just based on sort of my gut feeling of watching these horses and races over the years, I get the sense this horse is really good. And I'm not concerned about a lot of the things that people are getting concerned about with him. I'm not so much a believer in this Dubai jinx that a UA Derby winner can't win the Kentucky Derby under any circumstances. All different types of horses have tried this. Some of the horses that have gotten the most attention coming out of the UA Derby have been deeply flawed. Mendelssohn, who won Gate to Wire in Dubai, which a track could be very favorable to that style. It'd be Thunder Snow, who was a nutcase in Kentucky Derby and didn't even finish the race. Derma Sodagake, who got that front running trip in Dubai, and we've seen since can be a little quirky himself. Forever Young, I mean, he, I guess some people might say he has his quirks, but he's shown in his races, he overcomes them and he just wins every time. So, uh, I think this horse is really good and he's going to run well. I, I I just think he's a super interesting horse in this race. And I'm seeing a lot of people take more of a negative stance in him than I was anticipating. So I think he could be somewhere around 10 to one in here. Yeah. One, uh, just a couple things before we wrap him up for one, he really finished that race in Dubai strong. When I made the pace figures, um, I want to say the three quarter mile was like around a one Oh five or something. Uh, and he was obviously off of that. So to get up to that one twelve or so that I gave him, he was really finishing the race strong. So I have no doubt that he can finish off the race. The other thing when, when the entries came out for the, the Derby, uh, I kind of anticipated this horse might be the third choice. So I was maybe a little bit, eh, you know, I don't, I don't think he's going to offer any value. The more I follow and see people talking, this horse might be the sixth choice in this race, which it seems like he might actually be a bit of an overlay, in my opinion. 
Yeah, I'm getting that same sense, Craig. I don't know if he's going to be the sixth choice, but I, I was thinking he could be lower than catching freedom initially. And I definitely don't think that's going to happen now. Um, and, and I get it. I mean, the UA Derby path, it hasn't worked. And I think there's a lot of fatigue out there among handicappers taking these horses year after year. Um, I think this one's a little different. That's my take on it, at least. Number 12 is Track Phantom. Now, Craig, this horse... I mean, he looked really good early in the season. I mean, he won those three races in a row, including two stakes at fairgrounds. I, I loved his gun runner where he overcame a fast pace and kept going at the end. He just hasn't taken those steps forward since then. And I kind of compare him to Doorknock in that way that he looked so good over the winter and you expect these horses to continue moving ahead in their final starts approaching the Kentucky Derby. And he's just kind of hit a plateau. I guess you have to question the distance a, a little bit He's this big, rangy son of quality road. So he physically looks like one that could get a mile and a quarter, but he just hasn't finished off his last two races the way you want to see. And it's not like he had big excuses in terms of fast paces. So I'm a little concerned about whether he's ideally suited to this race. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I've been against him in both of his last couple starts. I like Sierra Leone two back and I liked the top two last time and It'd be kind of hard for me to get back on his train now. I didn't like him because he wasn't running particularly fast. He had everything his own way. Um, he faced uh, some pressure last time, and he backed up even more than he did the time before. So a mile and a quarter seems like a stretch to me for him. Um, the one thing I'll say about him, if I had to make a bet who I thought would actually lead the race after a half mile, it would probably be him, uh, despite what the trainer says, because he just gets out of the gate so fast. He's going to have blinkers on, and I don't see why you just wouldn't go on with it. Maybe he's fast enough and Doorknock gets out and he just sits right off his flank, but I suspect he's going to be right up there. I, I just don't see him being able to finish off the race. Yeah, I, I don't really like him as a win candidate, Craig, um, and I think I, I gave that sentence in my spiel just now. Um, but I'm not going to, kind of like just the touch, mm -hmm. I'm not going to totally write him off for rounding out the bottom rungs of trifectas or, or superfectas, if that's what you want to play in the Kentucky Derby, because two things going on. Nobody likes this horse. And then maybe there's good reason for that, but he's going to be a price in this race. And he's got a lot of foundation. He's got that, those excellent gate habits where you kind of know he's not a horse that's going to have trouble at the start. He's going to get out there and, I'm not going to be surprised when he's the one leading them into the stretch. And the horse that leads them into the stretch in the Derby, I mean, has a habit of hanging around. So I don't really like him to win the race, but I'm not going to be shocked if he, you know, hangs on for third, fourth, fifth, because he's not bad. I mean, he consistently runs numbers that are good enough to, you know, finish fifth in the Derby. And maybe he does a little better than that if some other have, others have trouble in here. I'm not viewing it as a horse that's, that's going to be 15th in the race. I'll, I'll put it that way. No, I mean, I think he's going to get a good trip. He's probably one of the few in the, in the race that it's almost a guarantee he'll get a good trip. Um, and, you know, we, we've we talked about we both like horses coming from off the pace, but even when that happens, it's not like you generally get a whole slew of closers. It's usually one or two coming. The rest find trouble and don't really make a run. And there's always a horse or two that kind of sticks around that you don't expect. And, he could very well be that horse. I don't see him as a win candidate, but I totally agree with you on the uh, the, the lower sides of the exotics. The number 13, West Saratoga, Craig. Um, I don't need to spend a whole lot of time on this one. I imagine there's going to be a lot of coverage around, you know, what a cool story this horse is. You know, a trainer that uh, really has never had a horse on this level before and has dreamed of winning the Kentucky Derby or having a horse in the Kentucky Derby. And the way this horse has gotten here, I mean, just, just barely getting the points, you know, scrappily you know, nosing out horses to get second and third in a couple of prep races. Um very cool horse who's got a lot of experience under his belt. It's just hard to see him taking the necessary steps forward to win the race. Yeah, he would have to take a big jump in speed figures. And his best speed figure came on a synthetic surface. So maybe his future lies on the grass or on synthetic surfaces, although there's not a whole lot of places to show that ability anymore. Uh, the one most notable thing about his PPs for me is three back when he lost by over a dozen lengths to Book of Dano, uh, the horse we were talking about that Forever Young was able to beat. So great story. And I actually am one that, that likes seeing these kind of stories derby weeks from connections we don't normally hear from but 
it would be a fairy tale story, but it's not one I see happening. Number 14 is Endlessly, Craig. He's another one coming out of a synthetic race. He was actually the winner of the Jeff Ruby stakes and did so very impressively. I mean, there was no doubt he was best that day. The big question with Endlessly, Craig, is the surface because he's a turf horse who was able to transition that turf form to synthetic. But now they're trying the dirt. He's never really trained that well in the dirt. Um, maybe he's training a, a tick better than he had in California at Churchill. Uh, but still, I, I've watched his recent workouts. I've not been that impressed. Um, and it just seems like Michael McCarthy, his trainer, doesn't didn't really want to run here. Um, obviously, the owners um, you know, they they bred this horse, and you know they want to have a horse in the Derby. And they've been longtime owners in the game, so I get all of that. It just kind of seems like this is the wrong race for endlessly. Yeah, I, I totally get that. I, I know it seemed like his trainer wanted to go in the American turf. Uh, I'll be full disclosure. If I was the owner, you're darn right. I'd probably want to run in the Kentucky Derby. Why not? You may never get that chance again. And, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of perks that come with that, that, that they'll like. That said, I, I want no parts of betting him. I see nothing that would indicate he's a dirt horse. Most of the, the training reports I've seen have not been very flattering. No, I just say the last couple have been a little bit better, but there's just nothing for me that, that indicates this horse is going to take the dirt and be a factor in the Kentucky Derby. Number 15, domestic product. He is the other Chad Brown horse in this race, Craig. And he's one that I've seen attracting a little bit of uh, groundswell support coming into the Kentucky Derby. Um, and, and I guess I understand. I mean, it's a Chad Brown horse ridden by Irad Ortiz. So, I mean, how high a price can this horse really go off at? Um, he's he's trained very well coming into the race. And I think that's where a lot of the you know, the interest in him is coming from because he was the work made of Sierra Leone most recently. And I think, you know, some people could watch that workout and say that domestic product was asked for a little bit less than Sierra Leone in the work, even though maybe Sierra Leone was uh, moving a little uh, more, I should say, with a bigger stride across the wire and presents more as a horse that's going to relish the mile and a quarter as opposed to domestic product. The problem with him is obvious when you look at the past performances on screen, Craig. He's just He's just never run a fast speed figure. And I get the argument that his last two races, the numbers have been held down by slow paces, but he's got to get a lot faster. He does. I mean, I, I think he's probably a better horse than what the speed figures indicate. Uh, he's run well in the last two, but on the other hand, I mean, who are those horses? He lost to Hades. Um, yeah, he finished ahead of fierceness that day, I guess. So I guess he has that going for him. But it just was not – they're just not very good races. Um, can he improve? Yeah, I think he will improve. Can he improve 20 points to get to what it's probably going to take to win this Kentucky Derby? I might even take a shot that he would do that if he were going to be more of a price. But like you said, I'd probably need 40 or 50 to one to take a shot a horse on a horse like this. And that's just not going to happen with Chad Brown and Irad Ortiz, I wouldn't think. Now, I'll be watching because I think this horse is probably the second biggest wild card in the race after T.O. Password because we really don't know. But there is one race in his PPs where he was in against legitimate derby horses and he didn't really run very well at all. Uh, it was that bias day of the Remsen over a muddy track. So make of it what you will. But he spent a lot of time on that strong rail that day and really had nothing left at the finish. And, and whereas Dornock and Sierra Leone ran away from the rest of the field. So it's not like he's a total unknown. He did have one chance and he failed it pretty miserably. Yeah, I, I, I'm skeptical that he can improve enough. I, I get the argument that his last couple of races might be a little better than they look because he did make up some ground into slow paces, but I don't love the feels that he was facing. I mean, who cares that Fierceness is in the Holy Bowl? It wasn't the version of Fierceness that people are going to be betting on the Kentucky Derby. And I mean, Craig, you, you were right about Hades. He's he's not much horse and uh, you know, domestic product not able to run him down and I don't think a whole lot of the Tampa Bay Derby horses. I mean, we'll get to one next that uh, is tough to make in this race. And he didn't even run that much worse than domestic product. So personally, I don't get this horse, uh, but I know he's got his fans and he is going out for some very strong connections. 
The number 16 is Granmo the first. I was just alluding to him. Um, he qualified through the Tampa Bay Derby and then subsequently finishing a distant third behind the good version of fierceness in the Florida Derby. He is one of those horses that earned a career best in the Florida Derby. We kind of already covered that discussion talking about catalytic Craig. This horse has had more starts than that one, and I'm not sure how much more upside you can really project for him. And he's just never really run up to a level that you would need to see to consider a horse like this in the Derby. No, the really the only thing I could say about Grandmo the first, we talked about the speed figure last time. Maybe it wouldn't look like such a jump if that Tampa Bay Derby had had a more reasonable pace and he ran a 106 speed figure that day, but he's still got a long way to go. He was no match for fierceness. Uh, he was no match for catalytic, really. Uh, that one held him off pretty easily. So this would be one of the bigger surprises I can remember in a Kentucky Derby right up there along the lines of even a rich Drake. Well, Craig, let's talk about this favorite, the number 17 fierceness. And for the record, he's not going to be breaking from post 17 now with, uh, with uh, Encino coming out. Also, for the record, the jinx was not on post-17. It was on number 17, so that makes it even more meaningless. Um, I think American Pharaoh won from post-17. He was number 18. Um, but regardless of all of that silliness, um, fierceness, no doubt, he is the most talented horse in this race on his best day. We saw it on debut. We saw it in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, and we definitely saw it last time in the Florida Derby, and I'll just pull up the replay of that race, which can play as we're talking about fierceness. Um the narrative around him that might cause some concern, Craig, is that he's unreliable because in two out of his five starts, he just has failed to show up at the level that we're expected to see from him. Uh, the champagne, basically a non-effort. He didn't get to the front. He was in behind horses and just never really got into the race. And the Holy Bull, we talked about, got bounced around at the start a little bit. That Even though he was third, that was nowhere near the good version of fierceness. And you know, John Velasquez, even in subsequent interviews, had said, he, he, that race kind of leaves him scratching his head a little bit. Um, you know, he says, you know, he repeated the Pletcher line that maybe Fierceness wasn't fit for that race. Fierceness was pretty fit for that race. I was watching his workouts going into it. He was training really well. He's a horse who always trains well. He just didn't show up in the Holy Bull. Um, he did show up in his Florida Derby that we're looking at, Craig. But when you watch back this Florida Derby, you are noticing he got a pretty easy lead through the opening quarter in 24 plus seconds. And while the pace figures are fairly even throughout, it's not a slow pace by any means. It was a pace that was very much within Fierceness's comfort zone. You could see he's got his ears pricked. He's just traveling very easily out there on the front end, really not getting any challenges from anybody in behind. My biggest concern with Fierceness isn't so much that he's unreliable. It's that in his good races, he has not encountered the kind of pace scenario and pressure that he's likely going to face in this Kentucky Derby. That's definitely true in this Florida Derby where it was just a cakewalk up front. And it was also true in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, Craig, where, yes, I know he was not alone in front. He was alongside another horse early. But that's a race that did feature blue color-coded fractions in Time Form US. It was a slow-paced Breeders' Cup, and it made it really tough on some of the closers. So he had all the best from a pace standpoint that day. And we know he can come home really fast when he's able to set comfortable fractions up front. What I don't know about Fierceness is if he can run 22 and change at the quarter, slow it down, and then produce the stamina to finish over that last quarter mile going the 10 for long distance. I'm not so sure about it, and I definitely don't want to take a short price finding out. No, I I mean, look, if, if Fierceness was a horse who was going to be 12 to 1 in the Derby, I'd probably love him because he's the fastest horse. He's run two of the bigger numbers in the field. Maybe it is the two best numbers. But I think there's some real concern in that his wins have just come with basically the easiest trips imaginable. I mean, let's be honest. Yeah, he ran fast in the Florida Derby. That race stunk. I mean, he won by 13 lengths. There were no real... Um, credentials going into the race. I think the second choice was that Shug McGay horse who was coming off a pretty slow allowance win, to be honest, and basically ran back to that race while getting blown out. And, you know, he's thrown in some real stinkers. The Holy Bull, he had every reason to win that race. Even after the bad start, he was in perfect position. Not only didn't he win, he couldn't even hold off domestic product for second. So, 
fierceness isn't going to be for me in here. I was pretty shocked when I looked at his PPs. It's one, even though I think I personally, maybe not the Breeders' Cup, but all his other races I made the pace and speed figures for. Um, I was surprised there have been no red fractions, given the talent this horse has shown in his wins. And that really concerns me for a race like the Kentucky Derby, where I expect the pace to be fast. I expect him to get pressure. Uh, I don't know how he's going to get that easy trip. Uh, is he going to sit four wide around the turn in a fast pace to avoid having uh, pressure? That's not really a recipe to win a race like the Kentucky Derby. Uh, if the pace is fast as we expect, being wide on the first turn. So I've just got real concerns. I mean, this horse probably is going to be three to one, maybe five to two, even as the morning line has them. And that's just not something I want to make a bet on in a race like the Derby, where I think there's just some much better alternatives. Yeah. Personally for me, Craig, given all those concerns I have, my fair price on fierceness is closer to seven or eight to one. <laughs> We're just not getting that. So um, he, he's kind of the key to this race for me in that I'm tossing him and I'm going to try to extract value from this derby by not using fierceness. In the, the outside or to the stall right next door to fierceness as I <laughs> mess up this transition is the number 18 stronghold. Um, this horse, Craig, way more reliable i mean you can't argue this horse has showed up in every start now he definitely does not possess the talent that fierceness has i mean i think we know that by this point it's he's already had six starts under his belt but i admire this horse's consistency i mean he's never been out of the exacta he took sort of an unconventional route to get here going through sunland park and really not beating much that day but i liked his santa Anita derby from a visual standpoint i mean he traveled well in behind horses got that split and upper stretch and went on through the way that you want to see a horse do if he's going to you know take advantage of those similar circumstances in the kentucky derby i would have liked to see him run away from imagination a little bit because it seemed like he had the race one at the eighth pole and he didn't quite get away from that foe um so i i, I wonder about the quality based on all of that but He's a pretty nice horse. I don't want to totally write him off getting a small piece of this. No, I could say the same thing, similar to what we said about um, Track Phantom. I could see him being one of those horses that, you know, with a quarter of a mile to go, he's right there. And he always seems to show up and run well. I mean, he's never been out of the exacta. His speed figures are, are in a fairly ascending pattern uh, his best race in his woods is last now he does have to take another step forward here but it's not totally out of the question he wouldn't be one of my favorites to win the race but i could definitely use him in tries or supers i, I don't think he's impossible yeah, I, I agree with all of that, Craig. Um, I have some concerns about him getting the distance of the race, but uh, he's pretty reliable, and uh, I don't want to totally discount him from an exotics standpoint. The number 19 is Resilience. He is the Wood Memorial winner, and he's another one of these horses that has just been slowly but surely coming along, improving at almost every start. Um, he arguably was getting some class relief in the Wood Memorial coming out of that very tough Risen Star, where he faced uh, four other horses horses that are all lining up in the starting gate for this Kentucky Derby. The Wood Craig, it's another one of these prep races that just didn't really have much in behind fierceness. Um, I think some of the horses that were expected to do well in this race, like a deterministic, just didn't really show up with uh, the effort that they were you were expecting out of them. And he got the job done, and he is moving ahead at the right time. He just probably needs another pretty big step forward to win the Derby. Yes, he would need to take another step forward. And he's another, as three-year-olds often do, who generally is improving almost every single time out, would have to take another big step forward. My one concern is we saw him in Louisiana. Uh, he was actually up close to a slow pace, and he wasn't able to beat three of the horses from that field. I view the wood as more of, as you said, a class relief. I, I actually liked him quite a bit that day. Um, thought he was just the best horse in the race. And Turned out he was, but how good really was that race? Uh, the other concern I have is given his running style, he's a horse who's always up pretty close uh, in his races. Now he draws what I guess will be the 18 post as we record this, and it, it just seems like not a great match for his running style. I, I'd like him a little bit more had he been drawn in, say, the 8, 9, 10 position where, you know, he could sit fifth or sixth too wide, but it, it's tough for me to see him getting a good trip from out here. 
Number 20 is Society Man. He was the runner-up in the Wood Memorial at 106 to 1, uh, and causing a big upset in terms of uh, the exotics and uh, creating some big payouts there behind Resilience. Um, Craig, he's a horse that I actually liked a little bit early in his career. Um, I think I, I picked him on top in the Withers uh, three back, and obviously that was not a good opinion that day. He was up the track. Um, but, but I saw little things in his first couple of starts that made me think he was better than maybe it looked on paper. Um, he ultimately kind of has figured things out. I mean, he won his maiden race with a big run from off the pace to win going away, and he showed that he could move that form into some tougher company next time in the Wood Memorial. Um, finished up decently to finish a clear set second behind resilience he's just another horse that you know kind of like the runner-up in the in the florida derby is gonna have to take another big step forward now facing a legitimate grade one field he's got to do it from one of the outside posts yeah i remember that uh when he broke his maiden because i remember thinking i wonder if david had him today and i'm probably looked but i don't remember (laughs) i assumed you did but uh yeah even though he won easily that day he ran a hundred speed figure he took a big step forward to a 110 in the wood at those huge odds but once again he's gonna similar he's gonna have to take yet another big step forward and have to do it from the far outside he's not a horse that's just gonna totally drop out of it but I mean, I could see maybe if you want to just throw a horse in fourth or maybe even third in your supers or tries, I imagine he'll be making a run late and maybe the others are just collapsing, but uh, I could never see using him as a win contender. I agree with that. He does pick up Frankie Dettori. I suppose you could do worse in terms of jockeys trying to work out trips from post-19 in the Derby. A horse that will now move into the main body of the field in post-20 at this point in time is the number 21, Epic Ride, who um, does get his shot in the Derby now that Encino has been withdrawn. And, you know, Craig, this horse actually has some credentials. Uh, From a speed figure standpoint, He's among the contenders in terms of, you know, the 116 that he got last time in the Bluegrass. That actually makes him faster than some of the horses that are probably going to be vying for third, fourth, fifth choice in this Kentucky Derby. Um, I might have some concerns about the distance for him, but if you're looking for a horse that's going to be 40 to 1, you could probably do worse than Epic Ride. Yeah, you could definitely do worse. I thought his Bluegrass was actually pretty good for his first try on dirt. Um he was able to read him behind that very fast pace. Uh, obviously out kicked by the top two, but I thought he ran fine. His speed figure kind of shows that. Uh, he gets, I think, a little bit of a boost because he was up close to that pace. And yeah, you could find worse shots than him. Now the post position is going to be an issue. Uh, obviously it's not ideal, but that's what happens when you're the morning line or the uh, also eligible in the field. I do want to say it's good to see that we were able to get the 21 on here. I don't know if you remember the old days of time form US when we had 21s and 22s drawing in. It drew quite the um, the difficulties for the time form us tech team so i'm just glad to see that's all sorted out these days yes thank you to our pro- longtime programmer dan <laughs> who i was communicating with just before we started recording to make sure the 21 would show up on screen when we did this and uh, he confirmed that it would so uh glad about that um as for uh the number 22 mugatu who has not drawn into the field yet and kind of hoping that the, you know, for all the sake of the connections, that there are no more defections um, from this Kentucky Derby. We'll see how that all plays out. Um, but I'll say about Magatu, Craig, who obviously seems like a real stretch from a contender standpoint in this race, was if if you're viewing the Bluegrass as some speed-favoring race where Sierra Leone overcame something to win, um, I think you might want to reevaluate that based on Magatu's running line because – he had never run a triple-digit time form U.S. speed figure before, and he was the other beneficiary of that fast pace, and he was able to rally past half the field to get up for fifth. Obviously, not close to winning the race, but he was only beaten seven and a half lengths by Sierra Leone. So if the pace helped him, it probably helped Sierra Leone too. Yeah, I'm not one of those who views that bluegrass track as being particularly speed favoring. I thought it was fair that day. The Lexington day was maybe a little different, but um, I view that race as one that Sierra Leone just got a great setup. Maybe he'll get one again. We've already talked about him. Uh, Mugatu, yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't ever see making a case for him, but you know what? 
if he gets in and you're going to bet a horse like him, we've certainly seen surprises in the, the recent past with horses with worse looking running lines than his, to be honest. So it's the Kentucky Derby. Literally anything can happen, but I still handicap it the best I can. And basically at the end of the day, we've gone through all the horses. We talked about the pace projector. This is one year I'm actually really expecting a pace meltdown. And that's how I went with my selections. Uh, before we get to those, uh, any final thoughts from you? Yeah, I, I want to talk a little bit about our picks in this race, Craig. But we already did our picks on the other video. What I kind of want to know is, how would you think about betting this Kentucky Derby? Because we're talking about some horses we might use in exotics, those that we would you know, want to make our top picks. Are you viewing one horse as a win bet, potentially multiple as win bets? How are you thinking about maybe attacking this Derby from a wagering standpoint? I, you know, it's one of those, I, I'm not going to be playing horizontal bets because I, I just think the, the races are way too difficult leading into this derby. I, I don't have the kind of money it would take to give ample coverage, but I will definitely be playing verticals. That's where I concentrate. And yeah, I'll be betting win. I'll be betting tries. Um, supers are kind of iffy, possible, I guess. Uh, and you mentioned the win bet. Uh, there's been times before where I've bet multiple horses in the Derby and I could see doing it again, probably even three or four horses. Now, a couple of them would be big long shots in here. You know, I would want 30 or 40 to one to have some money on, on horses if I'm going to bet that much. But yeah, that that's me. It would be a race where I'll definitely have some win bets and I'll have some exotic and try plays for sure. And your pick of the Derby, Craig, is catching freedom. Um you have a price you're looking for on him. Uh, I know it's tough to say this far out. Uh, we'll see how these conversations continue to develop and um, you know how this derby ultimately does get bet, but it does feel like he could be the third choice. What, what, what do you think is a fair third choice price, assuming that Fierce to sincerely own take the money that we're, we're expecting him to? Yeah, I wouldn't want any less than the morning line, which maybe that seems a little odd for a top pick, but in the race like the Kentucky Derby, I think catching freedom is going to be run well. I wouldn't be interested in him if he's six to one. Then I would probably focus on a horse like Honor Marie or even Forever Young if he drifts up. I, I am going to focus on horses who I expect to be coming from off the pace. Um, I would even maybe have a few bucks on Mystic Dan if he goes up because I wonder if that last race was was just kind of a prep, something to keep him sharp. And, you know, I think there's some question marks with him. Uh, just steal, I don't think is impossible. I, I think there's a lot of ways you can go. But, yeah, catching freedom's my top pick. I think he'll run well. But, yeah, if he drifts below that morning line, then I'm going to look elsewhere. That's just the way I play the races. And it, it's no different than me from the Louisiana Derby or an allowance race on a Wednesday. I'm looking for horses who I, I think have a better chance than what their odds show. And, you know, he could kind of go either way. Uh, when we recorded, I figured he might go a little higher. Now I'm a little worried about that. It may not be the case given all the buzz that I've seen. And Craig, you went four, two, seven, three with your picks in this derby. That's correct. Yes, that does sound correct. Yes. And, and I, Forever Young could have been my my fourth pick. It was kind of a toss up. And I went eleven seven four two. Um, for me, from a wagering standpoint, um, I agree with Craig about the vertical wager. Is you know I could place a nice win bet on this uh, Kentucky Derby if the horse is the right price. I want to get around seven to one on Forever Young, and I think I think I might get that price on him. So I'm very interested in him. Um, Honor Marie, I've got a fair price on him. I think around ten or eleven to one. So we'll see if that shakes out with him. Um, but as I was kind of alluding to, definitely want to key horses like Catching Freedom and to a lesser extent Sierra Leone in those trifecta wagers because I think there are very likely horses to be in the trifecta, especially Catching Freedom at what probably is going to be a better price. So um, you know, I'll play around with different types of boxes in terms of the trifectas and exactas like that, um, potentially keying on Forever Young and a few of those, but also playing around with some other horses. And on the bottom rungs of wagers like the trifecta, I could throw in horses like the six just steal, the eight just the touch, or the twelve uh, track phantom that we mentioned uh, potentially, you know, using and playing around with as we were discussing them as contenders. So it's a really fun derby from a, a wagering standpoint, a handicapping standpoint, a storyline standpoint. Um, 
a lot to look forward to this upcoming weekend, Craig. Quickly, because I promised it at the start, um, just to give a quick hit on the Kentucky Oaks, we did a total, a, a, an entire video on that uh, that you can find on the Daily Racing Forum YouTube channel. We went in depth in every uh, contender, but to just get it all one place, Craig, um, how are you viewing the Oaks on Friday? Uh, the Oaks is a race I don't think is as wide open. I think there's probably, um, going off the top of my head, maybe four or five main contenders. And honestly, none of them would really surprise me. Anybody else would. I think it's a race that I don't want to say top heavy because it's only five of the, it's five of the 14. So a full third, third of the field almost, uh, or more. Um, but of those, I really like what I saw from, from Thorpedo Anna. She would be my top pick in here. She's just done very little wrong in her career, and I've really been impressed with the ease of her victory. She does have that one blemish on her record where she came back in just two weeks at a, a pretty tough trip that day as well. But I really liked what I saw from her in a fantasy. It wasn't the strongest field we're ever going to see, but just the way she looked, the way she was able to do it from the far outside post, which isn't really easy uh, at Oakland. And she has a good tactical speed that I like to see. Um, and I just think she's the best of the others and, and might actually drift up a little bit where I think some others may drift down. Yeah, I'll be interested to see how they bet this race because it's a tough one to figure out where favoritism is going to go. Um, I, I've used seven horses that can win this race, and I kind of had trouble separating all of them, and I just found myself gravitating towards the two that I think are going to be the biggest prices. One of them is the number 12 Power Squeeze, who did get a good trip last time, but is a horse that reliably comes with a big late run, and there's supposed to be some pace in this oak, so she's one that I want to play around with. And the horse that I really want to focus on is the number three, Where Is My Ring?, don't know if she's going to be the 15 to one that she is on the morning line, but she just figures like she's going to be one of the bigger prices of those seven main contenders that I think are all fairly similar likelihoods to win the race. So the best value is going to be the one that's going to be the biggest price. And I think that could be, where's my ring? Don't really have distant concerns about her. And she did draw a much better post position than some others in this race. So that's kind of where I'm leaning in the Oaks, Craig. But there's a ton of great racing occurring this week at Churchill Downs, both on Friday and Saturday. Um, I'll just do the plug right now. I'll be writing DRF uh, betting strategies for both of those days with uh, my colleague Marcus Hirsch. We'll be doing analysis, written analysis of every single race on Friday and Saturday, coming up with wagers. We'll be teaming up on some multi-race wagers if you need ideas for how to attack a few of those pick five sequences on both the Friday and Saturday cards. So look out for more information about that on DRF.com. And also, Craig, if you already mentioned, ton of stuff going up on the DRF YouTube channel this week. We've got the Derby-thon on Wednesday, um, 24 hours of coverage. This is probably going to be part of it. You might be watching us on the Derby-thon. And uh, also a lot of great stakes previews from our colleagues, uh, Dan Illman and Mike Beer. So make sure to check out all of that. And Craig, just looking forward to the Derby at this point. Yeah, I've actually watched some of those videos already, and they're very well done as usual. Uh, thanks to our Lucia, who puts all this stuff together for us, doing a great job. Uh, and yeah, I'm just really looking forward to it. It's kind of funny we're recording this early. Uh, I don't mean, what is it, Tuesday? <laughs> I had to think about this for a minute. Uh, but I haven't really handicapped anything outside of the uh, the Derby and Oaks, so I'm going to spend the rest of my week digging into the rest of the cards on Friday and Saturday, even Thursday, because it's just a week that uh, you're not going to get this kind of handle most of the days, and it's a really fun week to bet a lot of good competitive races, and hopefully we can make some money because I, I think there's some really good racing coming to us. 100%. Well, everybody, thanks for tuning in to the Time Form US forecast this week. Remember, you can always catch these Time Form US podcasts on DRF.com, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube if you're watching the video along with us and checking out some of the Time Form US PPs as we viewed them during our discussion. So, everybody, thanks for tuning in. Craig and I will be back with another podcast next week, likely on Tuesday, doing the pace cast to recap the Kentucky Derby and all of the action from this upcoming week at Churchill Downs. Everybody, thanks for tuning in and make sure to catch that Time Form US podcast. Pacecast coming up next Tuesday.